Your bar, the Anchorman, is a gay bar. Well, that's ridiculous. Just look around. <laughs> oh. Oh, my. I don't mean to alarm you, but there are homosexuals lurking everywhere on television. They've been there for years, and this 1994 episode of Murphy Brown treated viewers to a heaping dose of gay lovers, queer history, and wanton singing of show tunes. All aboard and welcome to Matt Baum's Culture Cruise, where we take a deep dive on LGBTQ themes on TV and movies and books, games, and more. In the last video, we took a look at the 1992 episode of Murphy Brown, in which the gang learned that they have a gay co-worker. Now we're jumping ahead two years to the 1994 episode, The Anchorman, in which the gang learns that the gays are here, they're queer, and everyone's starting to get used to them. Culture Cruise is made possible by the folks who pledge a dollar or more a month on Patreon, folks like Jeffrey Atwood. Thank you, Jeffrey. There's rewards for backers. Head over to Patreon patreon.com slash mattbaum or click the link in the description to join the folks who make Culture Cruise possible. Murphy Brown's first gay episode in 1992 introduced the main characters to an openly gay co-worker. But in The Anchorman, which aired two years later, they're about to discover a whole bunch of gays. The episode starts with Jim buying a bar. His dream is to recreate his favorite hangout back when he was a young reporter in London in the 1950s. He decorates the place to look British, gives it a piano, a very open floor plan, and some soundstage bright lighting. And what do you know, the place is a hit. But when the gang comes to visit, they notice that something seems unusual. You know, it never ceases to amaze me. There are so many single women in this town, and yet the men always seem to outnumber them in bars. Yeah, what could it possibly mean? Murphy, you have just got to see the ladies' room. Not only is it empty, but it's spotless. It's almost as if no one's ever even used it before. <laughs> It's a real mystery what's going on here. And very nice to see you, Congressman Frank. Well, okay, Barney. Quite the head scratcher. I just wanted to ask if you were Murphy Brown. Yeah, that's me. <sighs> this is great. My lover owes me $20. I've talked before about how I like when characters use the term lover. This is Miriam Goodman, my lover. It sounds super awkward and strange, and I think that's why I like it. It really calls your attention to the fact that what sets queer people apart is love, and our desire to love and be loved, despite all of the obstacles thrown in our way. It's kind of like a brag. Oh, you've got a husband? Well, I've got to love her. Anyway, it's become clear that Jim inadvertently opened a gay bar, which means it's time for yet another round of I Can't Believe It's Not Heterosexual. So you think he doesn't know? I don't, I don't know! Know what? that this is a gay bar, that Jim is running a gay bar. <laughs> gay bar? Why on earth would Jim be running a... <laughs> oh my God, Jim's gay! <laughs> Okay, I love this joke. Every single time there's a gay episode on TV, some clueless straight fails to even consider that gay people exist until they finally, shocked and wide-eyed, figure it out. But this time the gay episode isn't about a person, it's about a place, which everyone gets except Corky, who does the familiar old wide-eyed shock but manages to get it completely wrong. It's a twist on the clueless heterosexual that is honestly pretty refreshing. And in fact, the joke is so good, it even gets a tag. Corky, Jim has been married to Doris for 25 years. Do you think she knows? At first, Jim is in some denial about who's patronizing the bar, which, to be fair, is understandable. In 1994, there were still a lot of risks to being out. A lot of queer people had to hide for their own safety. As a result, straight people just weren't aware of how many gays there were around them. At that time, one of the few places that LGBTQ folks could safely gather to be open and out was gay bars, which Jim has just discovered. Your bar, the Anchorman, is a gay bar. Well, that's ridiculous. Just look around. <laughs> oh. Oh, my. Honestly, I'm not sure what we're looking at because it looks less like a gay bar than an ad for Men's Warehouse. Jim tries to be cool about it, but this just isn't what he wanted when he bought the place. He wanted to recreate the atmosphere of the bar he loved back in London, and this is not how he remembers things. While Jim goes for a walk to clear his head, Corky makes friends and learns a few things. I just had the most wonderful conversation with that table up there in the corner. Do you have any idea how many of history's great men were gay? I didn't. Aristotle? Gay. Michelangelo? Gay. Laurence Olivier? Gay. Or straight. Depends on which biography you read. <laughs> this joke seems like it's written specifically for the gay history nerds in the audience, and I want to give it a hug. Jim returns, and he's made up his mind to get rid of the place. Well, I have no problem with this being a gay bar, Murphy. I just don't want it to be my gay bar. <laughs> I wanted to recreate something very special to me, and as much as I'm glad the place is doing well, it's, it's just not what I had in mind. It was foolish of me to even 
try to recapture the past. Can't be done. So that seems to be that. The gang heads for the exit, but Jim lingers for a moment at the piano. He never even had a chance to play it, so they all gather around. They're singing They Can't Take That Away From Me, written by George Gershwin, who was gay, or maybe not, depending on which biography you read. It's a song about remembering the good times, even after they're over. The way your smile just be, just be. The way you sing Oh, but you know what happens when you start a sing-along around gays. The way you haunt my dreams No, no, they can't take that away from me And so it goes, late into the night with the Jim Dial Gay Men's Chorus. Two important realizations happen at the end of the episode. One is that gay bars are better than straight bars. And the second is that Jim's memory of the past might not be entirely complete. Back then we had people like John Gielgud, Somerset Maugham, composer Benjamin Britten. You know, Jim, all those men are gay. It's true. John Gielgud was a great actor of the 20th century. Benjamin Britten was a great composer. Somerset Maugham was a playwright and spy, the inspiration for James Bond, and once described himself as a quarter normal and three quarters queer. And there's more. James Baldwin, Christopher Isherwood. Well, gay. <laughs> Noah Coward, Tennessee Williams, a busboy named Quentin Crisp. <laughs> gay, gay, gay. Yeah, well, there. <laughs> I guess I did a better job recreating the old place than I thought. James Baldwin, Christopher Isherwood, and Noel Coward were fantastic writers. Tennessee Williams was a playwright. Quentin Crisp was, well, it's hard to categorize Quentin exactly, but here's how he described himself, as portrayed by John Hurt in a film version of Quentin's autobiography. You cannot touch me now. I am one of the stately homos of England. He must have made some busboy. In the 1950s, queer folks had to maintain a certain level of secrecy. John Gilgood, for example, never publicly came out, even after he was arrested for cruising. I'll alert the media. Other public figures went to great lengths to maintain the illusion of heterosexuality. Even Liberace sued someone who suggested he was gay. Uh, I think in the 50s, uh, any uh, publicity uh, along those lines was uh, very daring. and and uh, it called for a defense. But by the 1990s, which was only 40 years later, not a huge amount of time, gays could be at least a little more open, gathering in public places and talking openly about lovers. Jim's discovery that there were gays around him the entire time and he didn't even know it flows from that 1992 episode. In that one, some characters assume that if someone doesn't explicitly say that they're queer, then they must be straight. Jim assumed that he was hanging out with straight people like him, but it turns out that gays have always been there, whether or not he knew it. The episode's also a rebuke of nostalgia, yearning for a thing that might not have ever actually existed the way you think you remember it. Jim can bring back the superficial elements of the bar, like the decor and the piano, but it won't feel the same, because it was part of a time and place that just no longer exists. Times have changed. On the topic of times changing, there's also a bit of gay content in the recent reboot of Murphy Brown. Twenty years have passed and the gang's back together. In season 11, episode 7, they're all going to a fancy black tie dinner and Miles invites new character Pat. For reasons that are never explained, Miles insists that they go suit shopping together and the result is this sight gag. The weirdest part about this is that Miles is wearing a suit that's almost identical to Murphy's 22 years earlier in The Anchorman. I think she wore it better. Anyway, Pat's ex is working at the banquet, and there's a brief misunderstanding. When you said you wanted to see someone older, I didn't think you meant Grandpa Dorothy here. Now let's see, it's been 20 years. Are we gonna go back for one more drink from the I can't believe it's not heterosexual well? Of course we are. Oh, I get it. You're gay. Well, good for you. That's, that's great. The look that Miles gets from both characters in this scene is deserved. Why, Miles, why are you doing this again? It is the year of our Lord 2018, and sitcoms are still giving us the clueless heterosexual who forgets that queer people might possibly exist. But just when I was feeling exasperated about the return of the trope, Pat expressed his exasperation too. How did you not know I was gay? I feel like this isn't just Pat talking to Miles, but gay people talking to television in general. Stop being surprised that gay people exist. Gay people are out everywhere now. Gay bars don't have to be secret hideouts. The Liberacis of the world no longer have to sue gossip columnists to protect their secrets. Later, 
Miles gives Pat a ride home from the banquet, and Pat brings the waiter with him. Miles is clearly a little uncomfortable, but at least this way he's not going to forget that gay people exist. In the quarter century since Murphy Brown first tackled the topic of gays, a lot has changed about the way that queer people live. Back then, it was a lot more dangerous to be out, so when a queer person did make themselves known, it was a little shocking. But these days, gays don't have to be quite so invisible. And that's thanks to queer people who are open at work, who gather together to socialize, who openly expressed affection around other people. Every time a queer person asserted their very existence, they became a little more a part of everyday life. With each day that goes by, the closet moves closer and closer to being an artifact of the past. And with any luck, it's one classic that'll never get a reboot. Land ho, we're pulling into port. Thanks for cruising along with me, and thanks to everyone who makes Culture Cruise possible with the pledge of a dollar or more a month on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash mattbaum, or click the link in the description to check out some of the backer rewards. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm needed at the local heterosexual newsman's bar. What'll I do with John?